Let's start with something a lot of people have told us. We'll also go even further back in just a moment. But just to get our kind of uh, uh, go through the gears one time, uh, let's talk a little bit about Ukraine and uh, and his. Uh, a lot of people say this was a road test for Putin. There were lots of other reasons why he was did what he did in Crimea and Ukraine and across the hybrid war uh, uh, scheme. W what did you s see was happening there? Uh, uh, from your perspective? Well, I think it really reflected Mr. Putin's interest in trying to correct a historical wrong in his mind as far as uh, Russia giving up. Um, a part of, of the what Putin considered the motherland that he wanted to reclaim, the, the place where the Russian Orthodox Church was, was born, and uh, he never felt as though uh, Ukraine and Crimea uh, should have left the, uh, the Russian even earlier, the Soviet orbit. And so therefore, I think uh, Mr. Putin wanted to, uh, to stop also what he thought was a, an Eastern march on the part of the, uh, the Western powers, NATO, EU. And uh, so therefore, I think he, he felt as though he, he needed to act um, because he tends to see things in zero-sum fa fashion. Uh, and therefore, um, I also believe he, he felt that he could do this with relative impunity in terms of not having a military response from the West or the United States. And uh, therefore, the move was, uh, was quick. Uh, but also, I think it reflected a broader strategic interest on the part of Mr. Putin to secure his near abroad, as it said, um, and do it in a way that I think he felt confident was not going to uh, beget a, uh, again, a Western military reaction. When you look back on it from our vantage point now, watching and thinking about what happened in the summer of 2016 in the fall, there are also all kinds of just tactical things he does, they do, that uh, resonate. A lot of fake news, a lot of information war, a lot of lying about things that happened. From your perch at the CIA, uh, what, were you, what were you watching and what were you learning or what felt new or, you know what I mean? Well, Mr. Putin is a, a creature of his, his past and of his intelligence experience. And uh, I do believe that uh, he, he sees, uh, and at that time saw, the Russian intelligence services as being a tremendous instrument of influence so that he could do things insidiously within countries such as Ukraine, Georgia, even inside of uh, Europe. Uh, that he could uh, try to exploit situations that was going to advantage uh, Russia. So when we were getting closer to the 2016 presidential election, I think some of the things that we were seeing early on were just uh, uh, symptoms and indicators of the of Russia's interest in trying to manipulate uh, foreign events to Russia's advantage. And therefore, uh, any type of of a political process or election, I think Mr. Putin sees as ripe for Russian intelligence service uh, engagement. And also there's a fair amount of, I think, competition among Russian intelligence services. They try to please the boss. And uh, they, they do things uh, both in terms of collecting information as well as their active measures, whether it be propaganda or even getting people to get on the Russian payroll. So uh, I think uh, Certainly CIA and intelligence professionals had a good understanding about Mr. Putin's um, overarching strategic objectives, uh, what he was trying to accomplish, and uh, therefore I think we had our antenna up um, looking for signs that uh, Mr. Putin was uh, pursuing these objectives whether it be in the near abroad, whether it be in Western Europe, or whether it be here in the United States. So in things like uh, sending in uh, uniformed soldiers with n no insignias on the uniforms, uh, wh what did you make of that? Well, in, in some respects, uh, he does things um, surreptitiously uh, with his intelligence services, but also I think he uh, likes to try to intimidate uh, his foes. And so uh, it was no secret to people that 
uh, individuals with military uniforms with no insignias who happened to show up in the eastern part of Ukraine uh, fighting against the, uh, the government forces. There was uh, no doubt in anyone's mind where they came from and that they were sent there by Mr. Putin. Uh, I think it was Mr. Putin's way to, uh, again, try to uh, bully others and, and to show that Russia is, uh, is there and is going to use its influence as well as its capabilities and its power to achieve its objectives. There were many arguments inside the United States government about uh, lethal uh, arming the Ukrainian forces. What did you believe? Uh, maybe you can't say what you advised the president, but the idea that we should, we should push back at him, we should in some way let him know he's not going to get away with this more robustly than we did. Mr. Putin is, I think, a very cunning individual and he really takes the measure of his adversaries and opponents. And when he moved into Ukraine, uh, I do believe he felt as though if he, if he did it with um, uh, great uh, emphasis and, and, and force, uh, that it was not going to engender a military response on the part of the West. And I do think he felt that, uh, certainly toward the, the last four years of the Obama administration, that there was a predictability as far as Washington's reaction. Um, and uh, I think he recognized that uh, President Obama was uh, reluctant to, to engage in military conflicts um, and therefore would use other instruments of U.S. power, sanctions, uh, for example. But I do think Mr. Putin's decisions to move into Ukraine, his decision to move into Syria with uh, military forces, was based on the premise that there was not going to be a uh, symmetric uh, Western military response. Um, I, I felt as though, in some instances, we should have made uh, our reactions less predictable to Mr. Putin. I felt as though there are things that we could have done that wouldn't have got us into a proxy war. I remember being on the schoolyards of New Jersey when I grew up and you know, bullies and try to intimidate and they keep moving forward unless they get their, their nose bloodied a little bit. And I felt as though Mr. Putin really needed to get his nose bloodied. Um, and I think it would have caused him to back off because like most bullies, he knows that he can't stand up uh, to others. It's a lot of uh, bluster and uh, his willingness to use that type of intimidating uh, tactics. I think could have been slowed, if not reversed, if he uh, in encountered pushback. Yeah. So, uh, does he feel in any way, is the ergo attached to that, uh, uh, a kind of a boldness to begin to probe our election process, to step forward in even a more robust way in 2015? in the initial sort of probes that uh, Mr. Clapper talked about back in 15 and the summer of uh, 2016, which you know and lived through vividly? Well, there is truth uh, to the narrative that Mr. Putin has, and the Russians, uh, and even the Soviets before them, tried to engage in uh, interference in elections for many, many years, uh, in the European theater in particular, but also here in the United States. However, over time, there are uh, new means and new techniques and new technologies that make uh, engagement in uh, the election process uh, more available, I guess, uh, to uh, manipulation by Russian intelligence services. And with the emergence of the digital domain and the cyber sphere and the ability to hack into uh, email servers, uh, I think there are just new uh, attack vectors and avenues for the Russian intelligence services to take advantage of. And I do think that uh, they had the direction to collect as much as they could, uh, as they usually do, about uh, political processes. But also, uh, there was a decision made on the part of the Russians, and Mr. Putin in particular, to authorize the, uh, the leveraging of that uh, intelligence that was collected, information that was collected. You said they've been in our election process all the way back into the Soviet Union uh, times, but things because of technology and other uh, things have improved mm -hmm. and enhanced their process. Yeah. <clears throat> so the U.S. intelligence community and CIA were quite mindful of uh, our responsibilities to monitor 
and to uh, assess uh, Russian activities uh, that were trying to undermine U.S. national security, uh, especially in a presidential election year. And so uh, we, CIA, worked very closely with FBI and NSA and uh, the Director of National Intelligence to make sure that we had our uh, radar uh, tuned uh, and that we were going to be very vigilant for any type of Russian interference. And uh, so we have a lot of experience and expertise at CIA and at the other agencies in terms of Russian tactics and techniques. And so we have some of the world's greatest experts. Um, uh, and so we were, I think, well prepared to, uh, to pick up uh, signs. Um, and uh, so as 2015 and 2016 rolled on, uh, we did have uh, clear indications that uh, the Russians were going to try to uh, maybe reprise in a much more intense and pervasive manner uh, some of their earlier efforts to interfere in elections. When, when Mr. Clapper is talking at Aspen in 2015, he's clearly concerned. He's raising alarm bells uh, because he anticipated something even, even worse than ever before or uh, the sort of generalized call to arms in 2015. Well, I think we saw a, a pattern over the last uh, several years, certainly in the second half of the Obama administration, when relations between Washington and Moscow were, were declining as a result of a number of factors. Uh, the effort to reset the relationship between Russia and the United States had faltered. Um, we had the Russian SVR illegals uh, that were rounded up here in the United States, uh, and it was a, a clear indication that the Russians were continuing on their usual course of trying to uh, undermine U.S. national security. And then we saw what Russia did in Ukraine, uh, and there was an aggressiveness, I think, across the board. Uh, and, and we saw things happening in Europe in elections there in the 2012, 2013, 2014 time period. And so there was, a, in some respects, a building crescendo, I guess, as we were entering the presidential election campaign season of uh, Russian aggressiveness. And so therefore, I think we were uh, very uh, concerned that we might be seeing uh, Russian efforts to undermine the integrity and uh, credibility of the U.S. Uh, presidential election in 2016. But, but people tell us that um uh, people in the government, high up in the Obama administration, say uh, that, that they they expected espionage, but that was a sort of standard operating procedure game that's played by us and by them and by everybody in the world around elections. But that the fear was the weaponization of that information, uh, the way that it had been used in Ukraine and even in Estonia, that they had a new toy to play with and that that was releasing that information and that they'd seen a little bit of it around the Toria Newland wiretapped phone call when they they released it and, and, and made political points out of something like that. That is that do I have that about right? Yeah, well, the Russians and the Soviets before them were very uh, proficient, let me put it that way, in the use of active measures on the propaganda front. For many, many years they would try to put into the Western media circles, uh, stories that uh, advanced Russian interests uh, and tried to uh, harm U.S. and Western interests. The, the real distinction over the last several years, again, is this digital environment where now you have uh, so many uh, new opportunities to apply your intelligence uh, wares. First of all, social media uh, has given intelligence services, uh, especially the Russians, a lot of opportunity to put things out into that so social media environment, uh, information that purports to be real, uh, but is part of their active measures influence propaganda effort. At the same time, uh, Russian espionage activities in terms of collecting intelligence that would be used in the past to inform Russian active measures now in and of itself can become a weapon, be weaponized, so that you can take emails and information that you collect uh, from that digital environment, uh, from servers and networks and email servers, and put it out in an effort to try to embarrass uh, your, your targets. And so what the, the Russian services uh, did, and what they are very capable of doing now, is reaching into that uh, cybersphere, uh, uh, collecting a lot of information, uh, 
uh, as we saw from the, the Democratic National Committee, uh, DCCC, uh, and then taking uh, and judicious and selective use of, of information and emails to be able to put out as a way to, uh, again, advance their interests by embarrassing uh, individuals that they see as, uh, as their targets. Before we go much further, let's go backwards just one more time for a little backstory. Um, uh, let, let, let's go to, let's go to uh, 2011, 2012, the protests in Moscow, the way that social, the way the story goes, social media invigorated people who'd otherwise not, not would not have come out, would not have come out nearly the numbers that they came out at those times in, in, with a sort of angry response to Putin saying, Medvedev is gone, I'm going to take, I'm going to take it again, uh, and lots of other reasons people using cell phones to verify it and then run it on the web and people hitting the streets, uh, confirming, I suppose, because it happens at the same time that Arab Spring is happening, uh, uh, Putin's uh, paranoia or his view that America, the hand of America is all over uh, all of this. And he doesn't apparently, according to people we talked to over there, he's not at the time very conversant with what is the web and how is the West using the web and is shocked and amazed at everything from Hillary Clinton's statements being broadcast all over the internet to everything else that's happening to him and he has to ascribe it to something, he ascribes it to us and our use of social media. Help me understand the, uh, your perspective on that. Well, I think Mr. Putin has uh, an affliction like, uh, unfortunately, many world leaders have, which is a innate sense of insecurity as well as paranoia. And I think Mr. Putin looked at uh, developments around the world as well as inside of Russia as uh, being uh, carried out in many respects by Western intelligence services. Uh, over the years, I was uh, quite frankly shocked when I would see so many things ascribed to CIA that CIA had no engagement in whatsoever. And I think Mr. Putin would look at developments, particularly inside of, of Moscow, if there was uh, opposition activity or if there were protests or any type of uh, actions that were um, counter to what he wanted. Uh, he saw CIA's hand behind it and saw the U.S.'s hand behind it. And so therefore, I think he uh, had this uh, innate sense of almost persecution <laughs> Uh, and also I think he felt as though not only he was being persecuted, but the Russian people were, and he felt as though he had to stand up for them. Uh, but uh, I must tell you that uh, uh, a lot of things that uh, Mr. Putin thought were a direct uh, res result of, of CIA efforts um, absolutely were not. It's an interesting thing. Here's a guy who's a KGB officer. We're now back in 1987, 88 who's a counterintelligence guy, right? He's, a, he's supposed to be paranoid. He's supposed to anticipate bad things uh, coming his direction. Talk to me a little bit about Putin, from what you know, from Putin, the uh, uh, profile Putin, the KGB officer in Dresden in, at the turn of, uh, at the end of the Soviet Union. Yeah, I think Mr. Putin was always a, a hardworking, diligent uh, intelligence officer. But he, he um, joined Russian intelligence, I think, during their waning days in the latter years of the Cold War, when they really felt uh, aggrieved and the much lesser uh, power uh, than the United States. So I think that just reinforced some of his feelings of insecurity. And uh, I think that carried over uh, to him when he then entered uh, public office in, in Russia. Uh, so I really f feel as though he looked upon the United States as being this enormous power that, uh, in his mind, I think, uh, unfairly used its power to subjugate uh, Soviet Union and Russian people. So I, I do think Mr. Putin had a, a real sense of this second-class status that was a bit of a chip on his shoulder that he always had to prove himself. You know, partly it was also the way he was uh, brought up in, in the, the, the period of time and, uh, again, felt as though he was... Um, being targeted by, by others, uh, and I think he always felt uh, uh, an urge to fight back. And uh, so therefore, when he uh, rose up the ladder of the Russian political system, 
Um, he, he was doing it at a sense of competition. Uh, he was doing it in a sense that he was trying to, I think, gain favor uh, at the expense of others. Uh, again, I think it just reflects his, uh, his, the prism that he looked at uh, the world with, but also he looked at his country with. Uh, again, I think he, in many respects, he's a loner. Um, he uh, looks out to, uh, for himself, but recognizes that he some frequently is dependent on other support in order to continue to, uh, to pursue his, uh, his goals and objectives. He must be an amazing actor in some ways uh, to go from Dresden to St. Petersburg, sign up with a Democrat, be, uh, rise up in the ranks, and then find himself six years later the head of the newly created FSB and soon prime minister and then president. Well, I think he has this um, very strong survival instinct. And so uh, when the Soviet Union was collapsing, I think he was looking for how is he going to survive uh, this uh, traumatic experience. And uh, also then when you had Mr. Yeltsin uh, emerge as the, as the president, I think Mr. Putin's effort was to try to ensure that he was going to be able to uh, flourish uh, professionally during that time. So I think he had you know, some chameleon qualities that he could adapt to the realities around him. But I think he was always driven by a sense that he wanted to be at the top of the heap. And uh, so in that respect, I think, again, he is a cunning individual from the standpoint of being able to navigate uh, some of the, the political shoals uh, inside of Russia, but also uh, I think he's, a, in some respects, he's a very astute observer of the international environment, and that's why I think he takes the measure of his uh, opponents and adversaries and counterparts around the world, and he tries to find their, their weaknesses or their soft spots and takes full advantage of it. And so I think um, he has been able to get the better of, uh, of a number of individuals. When he was appointed president, you were at the agency. Uh, um, what was the consensus about him? Was there a consensus about what was going to happen? Was he going to be a soft authoritarian? Was he going to be a continuation of the democratic principles that uh, uh, Yeltsin was trying to uh, uh, bring? Well, it certainly was a break from the Yeltsin years, and especially in the latter Yeltsin years when people were really concerned that uh, this individual, uh, President Yeltsin, was was uh, in a state of, of decline in terms of physical health as well as mental health. Um, and so Putin arrived with the reputation of being a, a serious person with an intelligence background, uh, somebody that the CIA certainly was looking at very, very closely. Uh, but he, in some respects, uh, from my perspective, and I wasn't following Russia in depth at the time, a bit of an enigma uh, because I don't think we knew enough about him and uh, what his ultimate aspirations and worldview were. Um, I think that emerged over time. But uh, I think people saw him as somebody who was going to uh, become immersed in, in his position. Uh, but still, Russia was climbing out of the, the Soviet era still. And there was, a still, there was a fair amount of jockeying among a number of uh, Russian uh, political luminaries, and so we didn't know whether or not Mr. Putin was going to be a, a passing phase um, or if he was going to be an enduring uh, individual from the standpoint of uh, you know, Russia's political future. He gives an amazing speech in 2007 in Munich where he essentially declares war on the world in some uh, a way, a, 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 a hell of a, a far piece from where he was when he uh, first took over in 1999. Yeah, I think it, what we saw was an increasing assertiveness on the part of Mr. Putin. Uh, and I think it was smart of him to, to start out rather you know, slowly. And I think he cut his political teeth when he was the, uh, was the vice mayor of St. Petersburg. Um, and I think he was, uh, again, a, a pretty good student. Uh, a good intelligence officer from the standpoint of collecting intelligence, taking book on people, and finding out where the seams might be, where the opportunities might be. Uh, and so therefore, by the time he had uh, you know, several years under his belt and then came back into the presidency, I think he had much greater self-confidence and a much greater sense of what he not just wanted to do, but what he needed to do in his mind in order to solidify his political base in Russia, 
I think when he uh, became uh, president uh, for a second time, I think it was at that point that he decided he was going to be president for life, and he was not going to give up power, and he was going to amass power, uh, not just on the, on the political scene in Moscow, but also uh, on the, the world stage. Because I do think he, he understands that time is not on Russia's side. When you look at the demographics, you look at the lack of diversity in the economy, you look at the brain drain, the, the loss of entrepreneurial and, and technical talent, I think he sees that he needs to seize the moment um, and try to be as assertive as possible uh, because um, over time, Russia's influence, I think he sees, uh, would wane. Uh, because if you look at the Russian prospectus, and I think he, he did look at it. Uh, he saw that he needed to uh, do things maybe sooner rather than later, uh, protect his flanks that he thought were under assault uh, by encroachment from the, the West, uh, but also demonstrate to others and potential client states that Russia was a force that was going to reassert itself on the, on the world stage, uh, because I think he does view the superpower um, competition between the United States and Russia in zero-sum fashion. And therefore, when he sees that the United States is, is weakened or diminished in any way, to include on the domestic political front in Washington, it only redounds to Russia's interests. And uh, that's where I think Mr. Putin really tries to, again, bloody the uh, United States' nose because he feels as though one, if that happens, uh, it just uh, accrues to his benefit. One of the things we've watched develop in this film is his creation of cyber and other weapons so that he can uh, fight above his weight in a kind of asymmetrical uh, way. We see the first instance of this in Estonia when they uh, shut the place down. What did you make of what they were doing in Estonia? What, what was the meaning of, of that to you? Well, I, I think... Uh, Intelligence services, including the Russians, uh, recognize that modern-day warfare uh, and modern-day um, political influence um, has a lot more avenues of uh, pursuit than it did in the last century, uh, again, because there are ways to uh, manipulate the, the cyber realm and to either send signals or to actually disable or cripple others. And so in places like Estonia, in places like Georgia, um, as well as in Ukraine, I think uh, Mr. Putin and his services recognize that they can do things without having to assert, at least in a physical way, Russia's military capabilities. You can do things that uh, are more insidious, uh, maybe a bit more subtle, but yet as, as impactful because you can do things uh, in the cyber realm that is going to bring down infrastructure, bring down capabilities of other countries. And so I think, again, as part of the bullying tactics and intimidation, uh, it's a way to uh, send a full broadside uh, against either adversaries or potential adversaries or ones who might be getting out of line a bit. And so when Mr. Putin looks at the, the Baltic states, he recognizes that uh, a number of things. One is that uh, he feels a certain obligation to some of the Russian-speaking peoples that are there. He also is very concerned that uh, these states that uh, were once under the, the yoke of, of, of the Soviets um, should not venture too far uh, to the West. So I, I do think uh, Mr. Putin is willing to pull some levers. Um, and it's, it's obvious and known to everybody that Russia is pulling the levers. But he's able to, again, send the message that he wants. Um, but he also, I think, has a good sense of brinksmanship as far as what he can do without uh, a, uh, a response against him that uh, he would uh, prefer to avoid. And, and just purely from a mechanical perspective, uh, your observation on is, is he, in a place like Estonia, in a place like Ukraine, is he pushing the go button, or are these is he like a, the head of a movie studio and he's got a lot of independent producers who do things? You mentioned earlier that they want to appeal to him by doing uh, great things that he acknowledges and, and, and really appreciates. So 
in in places like uh, Ukraine, in in the the hacking in, in, in that they used even in Georgia and Ukraine, but also Estonia, is it individuals and kind of he calls them patriotic hackers, or is it or is it uh, uh, the GRU general says go, or the FSB general says go? I think Mr. Putin has has given his intelligence services a fair amount of of authority to move forward and implement some of his policy objectives. That said, I am also confident that any Russian action that has potential strategic consequence, such as taking down uh, cyber systems, digital systems, um, infrastructure in other countries, whether it be in Estonia, Georgia, Ukraine areas, that's something that he would have given his personal um, authorization for. I don't think uh, Russian intelligence chiefs want to go beyond uh, their ski tips as far as what it is that uh, they are doing that could um, escalate and spiral. Uh, so I do think things such as that, uh, or to engage in an election that could have some real significant repercussions, uh, I am pretty, I am confident, very confident that they would have run those things by Mr. Putin. The actual details of how it would be implemented is something that I think Mr. Putin would leave to his intelligence chiefs. Uh, but the, the, the go signal, the green light, uh, would have come from Mr. Putin. So when Cozy Bear jumps inside the State Department in 15 and the White House and other places, y you're, alerted, you're alerted to this and, and you assume it's Putin saying, let's go over there and, and uh, see what we can clean out of the closet? Well, I think there's a, you know, a real distinction between what intelligence services collect and then what they actually uh, do with that collection. I don't think the intelligence services need to get Mr. Putin's authorization to collect against their principal targets, whether it be against the intelligence community of the United States or State Department or even the White House. That intelligence collection is just part of the, uh, the MO of intelligence services. But to take information that is collected, maybe against those targets, and then to release it, I guess it depends on the specificity as well as on the, the potential uh, backlash. Um, uh, so uh, I think some of these things are sui generis uh, mm -hmm. from the standpoint of um, depending on what it is that they're doing, um, they will go up and seek Mr. Putin's approval. But the, the mere collection of intelligence is something that I think the GRU and SVR and FSB do on a regular basis. Uh, taking some of the information and seeding it into maybe some of their propaganda, I think that also is part of the, the Russian MO. But to do something that is going to be uh, potentially explosive uh, as well as uh, disruptive, um, I, I do think that uh, those intelligence chiefs in Russia, the ones that have been able to survive over the course of many years, they know, I think, the limits of uh, their their prerogatives uh, and their authorizations, and that's where they go to Mr. Putin and say, uh, we plan to do this uh, or this uh, to make sure you get his head nod. So in 2016, when you first get an inclination that, that the thing that is going to occupy all of our minds last summer, uh, the, the, the first I can find in the press of you really talking about it is late June, early July, but you must have known much earlier that there, that Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear and other things were happening with uh, the DNC. Were you aware of things earlier then, or tell me when you were aware of, of uh, what was happening and that it was kind of different of some ki in some kind? CIA always has its counterintelligence radar up uh, for Soviet efforts to harm our national security. And uh, there are things that we see uh, that give us indications about uh, the Russians going down a particular path or trying to exploit a certain opportunity. And uh, it's our responsibility and obligation to make sure that we keep our uh, senior officials in the White House informed, uh, that we keep our FBI brethren informed. And so through the course of 2015 and 2016, CIA was fulfilling its responsibilities 
to monitor, to collect, and to inform. And uh, I am loath to give any particular time frame or dates uh, or reasons uh, because uh, that's part of the intelligence business. And we look at uh, the situation, we, we identify certain bits and pieces of data, and we, we correlate them. Um, it's like people who, I think, uh, observe the weather. You see certain barometric conditions that are starting to form, and you say, you know, this seems as though it's ripe for uh, a tornado to develop, and so what you try to do is to track it and to see whether or not those early indicators are true indicators of a rising storm. We start to hear about it in some ways in late June, early July of 2016. What what made it suddenly come on our uh, uh, radar screens? Well, during the summer of 2016, there was a, a fair amount of press attention to uh, various uh, efforts on the part of hackers uh, to get into uh, the systems. Um, obviously, the media spotlight was, was quite uh, heavy on the presidential election and the campaign season and the uh, the contenders for the for presidency. So uh, there was just a lot that was in the air and there was a lot of interest on the part of uh, folks downtown uh, to see what the Russians might be up to. So uh, again, we were we were looking very carefully. We had our, our sensors out. We had our, our ears attuned and eyes uh, directed on the places that we thought the Russians might be working on. Uh, and so things started to emerge. Uh, and. As good intelligence officers, we were looking for indicators that might come through many different collection systems, whether they be uh, CIA, NSA, FBI, but also we were putting many, many years of expertise, uh, overlaying that over those indicators. Uh, also uh, touching base with uh, our foreign counterparts, uh, some of those European services that had up close and direct experience with some of the Russian activities. Uh, so this is all was part of the effort to uh, discern exactly what Russia was doing. There must have been a moment where you said this is different in kind in some way. And I know, and, and, and your alarm bells as an experienced person were ringing pretty loudly that a tornado was on the horizon. Uh, when was that? It was in the summer of 2016. And I, I don't want to be more specific than that uh, because I, I do want to be, again, mindful of the need to continue to be able to track and monitor some of the things that the Russians are doing. But in the summer, it was quite clear to me that we were seeing a campaign on the part of the Russians, that this was not just sort of the, the usual stuff that we had seen before, that it was a much more aggressive, much more intense, uh, and much more uh, worrisome um, effort because uh, the exploitation of the cyber environment gave us real concern that the Russians uh, could be up to things that uh, we hadn't seen before, and we didn't know what they were going to try to do. We had seen over the course of years what, what they had done in, in Europe to include you know, financial payments um, and, uh, again, intimidation efforts, even blackmail of uh, political uh, parties and, and political officials. Uh, so in some respects, they, they stoop to whatever tactic they, they can. But uh, this storm was brewing in the summer, which is why um, I decided that I was going to raise this issue with one of my principal counterparts, Mr. Alexander Bortnikov, on the 4th of August. So before we get to Mr. Bortnikov's uh, the phone call, um, y you're having, you're, you're worried enough, from what I gather, that you want to hold this really closely. This is not something that's in the PDB in, 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 the, in the morning with the president. This is not something that you're spreading around for the month of July, at least. In my intelligence career, I've been involved in many, many sensitive intelligence programs and activities. Uh, getting bin Laden was one of the most sensitive. It was held to a very few people. But uh, I must say that uh, counterintelligence cases are the ones that uh, the CIA and the FBI hold most tightly for a variety of reasons. One is that sometimes uh, it involves U.S. persons who have been 
recruited by the Russians and you want to make sure that uh, you protect that information uh, for the privacy of individuals who may be suspected but not actually guilty. In addition, though, it's an ongoing case and what you're trying to do is uncover what the Russians are involved in and in order to do that you have to make sure that you keep that information very tightly held because any exposure, any leak could be devastating in terms of shutting down a counterintelligence investigation because your leads will go dry. And so therefore um, when we saw that the Russians were actively and aggressively trying to interfere in our election, during the election period um, we needed to make sure that we did everything possible to aggressively pursue that, to uncover and discover what they were doing, but at the same time protect that information. And so we um, briefed uh, a very small number of people at the highest levels of government, uh, in the executive branch, as well as in the Congress, to make sure that they were aware that CIA, along with our intelligence uh, partners, uh, were actively and aggressively uh, seeking to uh, uncover and then as directed and as needed to thwart these Russian efforts. In those early days, who knows, before, before you send the, the sealed letter over to the White House in early August, as it's been reported, who's, how small is the circle that you draw? Well, first of all, I, I met with my people at CIA who were um, uncovering this information. And I wanted to really understand what it is that we knew, what our gaps were, our confidence level. And so we had some very intense and long meetings at CIA headquarters about this. Once it was apparent to me that uh, we were encountering something that was unlike what we had seen before, I reached out to the, uh, to the White House and wanted to have a meeting with the, uh, the president. And so um, I uh, had a phone conversation with uh, one of my uh, close colleagues down at the White House, and I said, I need to see the president. Um, and uh, I was able to get in and see the president uh, very quickly and uh, walked him through it and told him and the National Security Advisor um, and about one or two other people from the White House what we were encountering, what we had to deal with, and how we were going to handle it. And uh, I talked through the, some of the mechanisms that we would keep them informed uh, in consultation with the President and uh, the others at the White House. We agreed that I needed to reach out immediately to the Gang of Eight uh, as the leadership in the Senate and the House of Representatives and to make sure that they were aware of this because we thought that uh, it was most important for our, our senior legislators to know what um, the Russians were up to, but also how we were going to handle it. What was the, when you, when you go in and see the president, do you, can you put a date on it for us, or do you want to keep that? It was in the summer, <laughs> early summer. <laughs> it was certainly before really? I spoke, it was uh, <laughs> certainly before I spoke to Mr. Subortnikov. <laughs> yeah, so before that, of course. Absolutely. So sometime in July. So, um, What's the, how do you say it to the president, uh, Mr. Brennan, and, and how does he react? Well, I've, I've had some experience over the years in uh, briefing presidents and making sure that they understood exactly what it is that we know, how we know it. I wanted to not overbrief it um, and to make sure the, the president understood the, the foundations of our understanding and also make sure the president understood how we would be able to collect further on this, uh, what the limitations were, as well as the sensitivity of it. That's one of the things that I wanted to make sure that I underscored the sensitivity of, of this type of information. What do you mean sensitivity? Well, um, again, in any counterintelligence investigation, there are uh, an array of collection capabilities that you try to leverage, and you try to protect those sources and methods. Yeah. And so I want to make sure that I was able to share uh, the substance of the information, but also want to make sure, sure they understood um, how it is that we acquired the information and, and why is it that we have the confidence in it. So you can be specific with the president. You can say, whatever it is, we have somebody in there. We have technology. We have. I was specific with the president. I was specific with the Gang of Eight in terms of how we knew it. And I want to make sure that I highlighted the sensitivity 
Um, and uh, so the, the president, uh, national security advisor, a gang of eight, and some of the other senior members of the National Security Council were fully aware of um, the information we had. Now, not every bit in detail uh, I shared because there was no need to, but they needed to have a good understanding and grasp of the, the foundations of this information. The, the president's reaction on that initial conversation? Uh, the president um, in the summer of 2016 was already uh, well aware and I think um, appreciative of the intelligence community's capabilities and uh, also was well aware of Russian activities around the globe, uh, to including elections. So I think what he... You mean he, from the PDB or from the, the briefing? Yeah, over, over the years we've been sure. briefing him on what the Russians were doing in yeah. a lot of other elections and the Russian cyber capabilities or, or whatever. So it, it, was, it was not uh, shocking or surprising, but it was something that was, I think, worrying to all of us. Uh, particularly since we didn't know uh, the extent of what it is that the Russians were engaged in, and we didn't know w how far they would go to really uh, threaten uh, the integrity of the election. They hadn't yet done the wiki uh, dump. No, there were still things that uh, the Russians were um, ultimately did. Uh, that they that, haven't done yet right. when you have this conversation. Mm -hmm. the, the people have described him as uh, grave at that moment, having a kind of countenance of gravity. He was really, yes? The, the president was very concerned about um, what the Russians were doing. The president was very uh, focused on what it is we needed to do in order to uncover and to stop them from doing it. But the president also, I think, was, was rightly concerned about uh, doing something in the middle of uh, a presidential election season to thwart the Russians, but at the same time not um, assist the Russians uh, by uh, doing something that was going to raise even more questions about the, the credibility and integrity of the election. So the, the president was fixated on this. Uh, he told us to do everything we could uh, from a collection standpoint to make sure that we kept him informed, which we w did. But also, he was, I think, at that point then, um, really thinking about what uh, course of action uh, he, should, he should take uh, in terms of public uh, statements, actions, as well as uh, private uh, actions. Uh, so I think he was thinking about it as the President of the United States um, and wanting to make sure that the 2016 presidential election could be carried out um, in the most fair, free, and uninterrupted manner as possible. Yeah, uh, you had you had said earlier, John, that the, the the you knew Putin and you know how it works. You know how the the vertical power works there uh, to get something done. When, when you when you finally are convinced by your guys, and it doesn't sound like it took a long time for them to convince you that this was happening, are you? Are you saying this is a this is a Putin operation? This is a direct line Putin operation. Is Putin your your guy from almost the beginning? And do you tell the president that? From the very beginning, I made it clear to the president that it was certainly CIA's considered view that this was an activity uh, and a campaign that was uh, authorized by Mr. Putin. Did he want to pull Clapper and Comey in on this? Or are they already part of this by then? Well, uh, after I met with my people, the agency, I made uh, a number of phone calls. Uh, I spoke to uh, the White House to get on the president's calendar. I also right away spoke to Jim Clapper. Uh, Jim was not available to come down to the White House with me at the time when I met with the president. But I wanted to make sure that Jim was fully apprised of what it was that we had come to understand and what I was going to brief the president about. Um, and right after I briefed the president, um, as I recall, I uh, spoke with uh, Jim Comey and let him know exactly what it is that uh, we needed to do together and uh, had a conversation shortly thereafter with Mike Rogers from NSA. And because the president recognized that for any type of counterintelligence uh, effort that needs to be undertaken by the U.S. government, the CIA, the FBI, and NSA are the three 
principal agencies that really need to take this and do everything possible to uh, to understand it better. Did you guys know that Guccifer and Assange from WikiLeaks were waiting in the wings uh, right before the DNC dump, or or was it a uh, or did that come as a surprise? Um, we were <laughs> we were looking at what the Russians were doing. We were we were working through what options the Russians were considering in terms of taking advantage of some of their espionage exploits and their, their cyber hacking activities. And we were looking at the various mechanisms and distribution systems uh, that they could take advantage of. And so again, our experts and, CIA and FBI and NSA's experts uh, identified the more likely culprits in this. Uh, so again, we, we have a lot of expertise uh, that we were able to uh, take advantage of. And so when things started to show up and come out, uh, we were able to put together some bits and pieces of information and intelligence, as well as uh, look at it against the backdrop of things that had happened previously. The meaning of Wiki's uh, uh, release right before the Democratic National Convention to you, what what was the importance of that to you? Well, we were uh, following with great interest the, the timing of some of these activities um, in terms of when something would be released and did it happen on the eve of a certain uh, development or event such as the Democratic National Convention. And by looking at the timing and the action, one could then have a good sense of the motivation and it also would help to validate uh, some of the things that we had come already to understand or to believe. Uh, so we were tracking that. I think that's a very important part of the intelligence business. You look at uh, actions, you look at developments, you look at statements, and you look at things along a, a, a timeline and then do some correlations because it frequently will give you a sense of, of motivation and uh, objectives. So by now the press is going basically crazy about the story, and er and everybody is pushing. I, I would assume the Clinton administration, or the Clinton campaign is also saying, oh my God, right, because th they know. Was it, was it at this early stage, did you know the Russians favored Trump and, and were after uh, Mrs. Clinton? The intelligence community assessment that ultimately was published and released um, to the public uh, in early January, it had you know, three principal conclusions. One, to undermine the integrity uh, of the election, interfere in that electoral process. Two, to denigrate Hillary Clinton, either if she won um, or to stop her or to bloody her when she emerged as president. And then for Mr. Trump to be advantaged by these Russian efforts. And looking back, um, it was CIA's judgment, and I think the judgment of the uh, other agencies as well, early on, that um, it, the Russian strategy was designed to promote the prospects for Mr. Trump. So in the summer of 2016, it was our assessment uh, that the Russians were trying to enhance Mr. Trump's prospects for electoral victory. Even though it was our assessment uh, that the Russians didn't see him as the likely winner, but they had a, uh, a, a multi-pronged uh, campaign strategy. So yes, early on in 2016, uh, it was our view that the Russians were trying to improve Mr. Putin's prospects, which they thought were unlikely. You mean Mr. Trump's prospects? Mr. Trump's prospects. Uh, in 2016, they were trying to enhance Mr. Trump's prospects to emerge victorious in the election, even though they thought it was a bit of a long shot. Uh, uh, Mr. Trump's response must have been fascinating to you. Hey, go find Hillary's, hey Russia, if you're breaking, you know, go find, he treats it sort of frivolously almost, yeah? Uh, Mr. Trump's uh, comments about uh, Mr. Putin and Russia and Russian intelligence uh, have been baffling to me for quite some time. Uh, during the election campaign, when he encouraged the, the Russians to release emails to his favorable comments about uh, Mr. Putin, uh, these are things that uh, I still 
am, am very, very uh, uh, um, puzzled uh, at. Um, there's uh, the, the the post uh, uh, writes a story about a, a a letter you send over in early August to the White House uh, for the. Uh, for, to the, for the eyes of four people, the president and three other people. Did such a letter actually uh, go to the White House? And what, what was it about if you've already had a conversation with the president and, and, uh, and others? On the, on the morning of the day that I briefed the president, uh, I sent over a very uh, short note, cryptic note, that um, was for the president, the national security advisor, and a couple of other folks down there, that uh, gave the uh, the topic, the subject of the the briefing that I was going to provide to the president. Um, I wanted to make sure that they understood the gravity of what it was that I needed to brief, and therefore, uh, getting uh, on the president's schedule. And I said I needed some time to basically walk him through this. I wanted to make sure that they, they knew it. And so uh, I gave them a very, very brief heads up in a very short note that I sent over there in the morning. Uh, you remember I, what you said? Well, I, I talked about uh, this deals with uh, Russia and interference in the election. I think I had a few other lines in there. But I, I, I wanted to uh, reserve the, the substance of the brief, given the sensitivity of it, for my oral briefing uh, that I gave to the, to the president. And is it, uh, is it true, their report, that it was to be in the hands of only four people and it, would be, and it was to be returned? There were four people that were in the, the briefing uh, for the president. Uh, it was the president, uh, national security advisor, uh, deputy national security advisor, and uh, the president's chief of staff, and myself, and that was it. Feels like an unbelievably historic moment, huh? It was one that certainly I'll remember. Um, I understood the, the gravity of the issue. I understood uh, the importance of what it was that I was going to tell the president. Not because it was a one-time briefing. It was because we had our work cut out for us in the coming months. It was going to be a very, very uh, challenging intelligence effort. It was going to be a very challenging policy effort as well from the standpoint of what to do. And this was uncharted territory in many respects. I certainly have never been involved in something like this. And uh, we had to be thinking uh, constantly about what we needed to do on the collection side, what do we need to do in terms of um, informing policymakers, uh, coming up with options, uh, informing Congress, uh, what to say publicly. Uh, these were all things that we had to make decisions about. And uh, I didn't have a playbook for this. I had to uh, deal with it uh, based on my experience and based on my counterintelligence uh, experience. Um, and so we were navigating shoals that uh, I had never encountered before. And I must say, looking back on it, I think we did a pretty good job of, uh, again, working with our partners, uh, FBI and NSA and DNI, uh, keeping the, the White House informed and national security officials informed, as well as the Congress. And I very much hope that as the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees continue to do their work, that they will come up with some legislation that will mandate uh, certain things to happen prior to a presidential congressional election, for example maybe coming out with a public statement on the part of the Director of National Intelligence and the Director of FBI 120 days before such election to let the American people know what's the state of the uh, electoral system, uh, what type of hacking efforts have we seen, uh, and then maybe reserving for the uh, congressional leadership and the White House officials a classified briefing about the types of things that we're seeing so that there would be a bit of a legislatively mandated playbook so that uh, the future intelligence and law enforcement officials can really be able to uh, deal with this uh, uh, such a situation in the future uh, in the best way possible. For those of us who are trying to read tea leaves and connect dots from way outside up in the atmosphere somewhere, it, it looks early on in July and August 
like the FBI hasn't really signed on yet to the magnitude that you're talking about, and even Clapper seems a little behind the curve. We're going to talk to him next week, so we'll hear his side of that. But I just I don't I don't see from right away a kind of unanimity like like you had. Was that your sense too? Well. Again, before I briefed the president and I had extended discussions with uh, individuals inside of CIA, uh, inside of CIA we have FBI agents who are working cheek to jowl as part of the counterintelligence effort. And these are people who really look at every bit of information and bit of data. And so I think that they, they had confidence first before anybody because they were swimming in the data. Then when I started to dip into it as well, I became more confident. And that data, which was you know, multifaceted, um, had to, again, be protected. And then we started to bring others into it. Um, and that's why I decided early on that uh, having experienced uh, the run-up to 9-11, where uh, data from one organization was not shared with the others, and so intelligence dots were not connected, uh, I decided that we were going to hold establish a fusion cell inside of CIA that was going to have NSA and FBI there, and I wanted people to be able to share as much as they could among each other. So I think that fusion cell that kept me very much informed and was used to inform others, um, I think gradually, as more people became familiar with the uh, intelligence that we had, the understandings that we had, the expertise that we had, the experience of other Russian activities and elections, I think that picture became, uh, started to emerge for many people. So I think over time, there was greater confidence in the part of those who might not have been swimming in the data early on. But uh, I saw that as, as growing over time, and uh, certainly Jim Clapper and, and Jim Comey, I think, were uh, aligned, uh, exactly aligned um, with me as far as where we were uh, in our estimate of the Russian activities. So talk to me about uh, General Bordakov, the, the phone call. This is a regularly scheduled phone call that you would normally have anyway, but you decided with the president's permission to add this to the, to the agenda. Yeah. Over the course of my tenure at CIA, I became, I guess, much closer or had much more engagement with the head of the FSB, Alexander Bortnikov, who was basically the head of their FBI than I did with uh, Mikhail Pridkov, the head of the SBR, the CIA equivalent. Uh, I did a lot with uh, Bortnikov on counterterrorism information, uh, engaged with him quite a bit, uh, met with him a number of times. Uh, he, in fact, came to visit me at CIA headquarters. And uh, I had uh, ongoing conversations with him about what was going on in, in Afghanistan as well as Syria. And so on August the 4th, it was a scheduled call that I had with Mr. Bortnikov at his request uh, to talk about the situation in Syria. And uh, I said to myself first and then to the White House, there's no way I can have a conversation with Mr. Bortnikov at this time, given our, our confidence level about what the Russians were doing against our election, and not say a word about it to him. I just think that uh, that would not have been appropriate. And so I spoke to the White House, and I said, I'm speaking to Mr. Bortnikov, we're going to talk about Syria, but there are two other things I want to talk to him about. One is I wanted to make sure that I hit him upside the head once again about some of the harassing and uh, even violent uh, actions that the FSB was responsible, responsible for in Russia, in Moscow in particular, against U.S. diplomats. Time and time again, John Kerry and I spoke about the need to push the Russians uh, on this issue of the regular harassment that uh, U.S. diplomats and families faced in Moscow. So that was usually a part of my ongoing talking points. Yeah. But I also told the White House I wanted to tell him about the uh, Russian interference in our election. And I said, because there were a lot of things that were public at that time, I said I've been watching very carefully all of these reports about Russian interference in the election. And I told him that if they were doing this, uh, this would be a grave mistake, uh, that it was going to uh, roil uh, the relations between the United States and, and Russia for many years to come, that all Americans would be outraged over it, even if the Russians were trying to advance the prospects of candidates that some Americans were in favor of, uh, because the American people take very seriously uh, the uh, importance of the 
integrity and the freedom of our election system. Uh, Mr. Portnikov denied it. Uh, I again came back to it and said, this is something that uh, you need to take very seriously. And he said he would relay it to Mr. Putin. And I know that Mr. Portnikov, um, uh, who works very closely with Mr. Putin, uh, would relay that to him immediately because in past conversations, I asked Mr. Portnikov to pass messages to Mr. Putin, and I got a response within an hour. So he would have immediate access to him. So uh, Mr. Portnikov promised to do that. Um, I didn't hear back from him with uh, Mr. Putin's reaction and response. Mm. Uh, but Mr. Bortnikov said they'd be willing to work with either candidate uh, who emerged victorious in the election. But is it a surprise that you didn't hear back? That tells you something, doesn't it? Yeah, I, and when I spoke to him, I, I presumed he was going to uh, deny any uh, interference. I, I presumed he was going to, you know, tell Mr. Uh, Putin. But this was the f first time uh, that I think a senior U.S. official confronted the Russians. And when the director of CIA says very clearly to the director of the FSB, you know, cut it out, uh, I think that that certainly uh, has resonance then uh, in the Kremlin. Uh, and then there were subsequent uh, engagements between the United States and Russia. Uh, Mr. President Obama uh, confronted Mr. Putin, and then there were the public statements. So I ask myself now, as a result of those direct engagements with them, did it give the Russians pause? Did they decide not to do some of the things that they could have done? They continued to map the architecture of the electoral infrastructure, they, looking at state systems, and, but we put them on notice. And uh, did they then decide, hmm, let's not go all the way? Uh, yes, there were subsequent releases uh, that we saw from WikiLeaks, uh, but uh, some of the things that they could have done, they didn't do. And uh, there's a part of me that uh, says, yeah, those, those brush back pitches uh, <laughs> sent a clear signal to them. And uh, I think they recognized that this was uh, a very important issue uh, to the Obama administration. And uh, maybe they didn't have the same uh, predictability <laughs> in terms of what our reaction would be or appetite for whatever was going to happen if they kept uh, staying at the banquet. Um, it's a, yeah, it's, it's late August through September where it feels like inside the White House, and obviously you're involved in this, uh, there's a lot of talk about, so what is the, what should we do? How, how should we respond? What was the range of, uh, I don't expect you to be really, really specific, but what were the range of options available for the president and what did he finally decide to do? Well, the, the options looked at uh, a variety of, of paths. One is what do you do and what do you say directly to the Russians? That's one. The second one is what do you do and say publicly in terms of acknowledging to the American people what is going on? Third, what are the, some of the things that you could do to try to uh, you know, rattle the Russians' cage? Uh, maybe take some tangible steps, uh, whether it be symmetric or asymmetric. Uh, but then I think overriding all of this was uh, the President, President Obama's uh, concern about not doing anything that was going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy for the Russians, which was to call into question the integrity of the election. And particularly since Mr. Trump, uh, I think quite you know, blatantly said uh, that he was unsure if he was going to accept the results of the election. He was asked by you know, journalist newscasters, and I think he said something like, we'll see. And so uh, the president, uh, as uh, president of the United States, but also as the head of the Democratic Party, he uh, insisted that we not do anything that is going to either in reality or in perception uh, be a, a thumb on the scale of the November election. And so we were very mindful of the responsibilities to do everything possible to prevent the Russians from being successful in what they were trying to do, but at the same time uh, not to do anything that is even going to call further into question the integrity of the election because I, I could view some scenarios where there would be this escalating concern and then people would 
start to really wonder whether or not you know their vote was going to count and why would they vote or whatever. And so it was a very, very uh, delicate line to walk. And uh, CIA and the intelligence community and law enforcement, FBI, I think we recognized that we were uh, needed to be particularly careful in terms of not doing anything that could um, cause there to be a greater uh, disruption in the election. Uh, so um, these were weighty decisions and long deliberations and discussions, and we tossed things around, and, and uh, the statement that uh, Jim Clapper and Jay Johnson put out uh, went through uh, an arduous uh, review process, including the White House Situation Room, just trying to get the tone right, make sure the message was right, uh, again, not having had a template uh, that came before us, uh, we had to try to do the, the best we could. And uh, I think the, the president wanted to hear the full range of options, uh, which was the correct thing to do. Uh, and we looked at what those options were, and we looked at the potential efficacy of them, as well as the potential disruptive impact. And uh, I think uh, you know, our, the decisions that were made are now history. So during this month, the FBI, at least the way the press reports it, uh, there they are now, has, uh, has, has, has uncovered in some way that the Russians are also interested in, our, in the mechanics of the election. That, that feels like something that's of a different magnitude than propaganda or info war or whatever it is that this is really serious. Uh, uh, does it affect the debate inside the White House in September and uh, uh, late August? And in your own mind, does it change the magnitude of how important this is? Or did you already know that it was happening? Well, uh, the Russians uh, will map the, the architecture and the environment of their, their targets. It's called uh, Operational Preparation of the Environment, OPE. Uh, they do it for military purposes uh, so that they understand exactly what they can do. And so when we saw them starting to um, look at state electoral systems, I think the sense was that uh, this gives them the opportunity to uh, digest uh, what those systems look like and then to formulate uh, options or opportunities that they might be able to take advantage of if they wanted to actually do something against those, those voting electoral systems. Uh, and that's where um, it's very important for the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI uh, to understand uh, what they were doing. Uh, so uh, I had a number of conversations, including one-on-ones with Jay Johnson, um, as, as he was doing uh, what he could to uh, work with the state officials and to uh, lend assistance to those who are trying to protect uh, their, uh, their electoral processes. The way the story goes, he calls lots of states. Many of them rebuff him, not interested. Federal go keep the federal government out of our election process. Whatever they say, is that a surprise to you? Uh, uh, no, I think we, we, we understood that there was going to be some resistance on the part of states. Again, I didn't deal with any of the states. That's not CI's mandate. Right. You know, I saw it uh, in two ways. Uh, one is goes back to uh, the uh, Hamilton Jefferson <laughs> division about states' rights and, and national rights. Uh, secondly, uh, some of those those states uh, were concerned not just about the uh, federal government's interference and in what they see as an inalienable right of states, but also partisan politics. I think started to swirl about and wondering whether or not a, an administration that is a democratic administration trying to come into uh, states' uh, voting systems, electoral systems, whether there could be uh, something up with that. Was Johnson free to tell them the magnitude of what the worry was? Uh, I, I think uh, Jay Johnson tried to be as clear as possible about the nature of the threat and the risks that were out there. Hmm. But also there was just so much in the public domain at that point that anybody who uh, thought that the Russians were not uh, actively involved in trying to interfere in the election was not uh, reading the paper, watching television, or uh, using their common sense. Well, and you had had, the way the story goes, you had had a similar experience up with Congress in your initial uh, uh, trek up there to talk to, 
to talk to the Gang of Eight and others, that they were, you, you were met with some partisan response and even serious doubt. In those briefings of Congress, uh, some of the individuals expressed concern that this was um, motivated by partisan interests on the part of the administration. And I, I took offense to that and, and told them that um, this is an intelligence uh, assessment, this is an intelligence matter, and I wanted to make sure that they were informed because uh, their gang of eight responsibilities required them to uh, take this uh, seriously. And so I told them that this in no way reflected any type of partisan effort. Uh, and so uh, they, they understood uh, that I was serious about it, certainly. Um, so even after they, and you shared the intelligence, I shared the intelligence with the, yes. So even uh, after that, they still uh, think of it as a partisan uh, issue? Uh, yeah, even though I had served in intelligence for several decades, uh, I think they, some people still saw me as, a, as the CIA director appointed by a Democratic president, even though I had served uh, six presidents, three Democrat, three Republican, mm. and I reminded some of that fact uh, that uh, I take this very seriously, I take my responsibilities seriously, and I am very concerned about what the Russians are doing with that election. Uh, you talked about the October 7th release of uh, Mr. Clapper's, the DNI's report, uh, three or four paragraphs. There was once a paragraph about Putin specifically that gets dropped by the time it's publicly issued. Do you know why? We want to make sure that the statement that came out was going to reflect as accurately as possible what it is that we knew and what we assessed, but at the same time to make sure that we were able to uh, protect sources of methods. And so there were decisions made in terms of what should be included or what should not be included uh, that uh, reflected those dual concerns, accurate, but at the same time protect sources of methods. So you were worried about a source in some way or a method in some way uh, being revealed if you tagged Putin with it? I think the, uh, the editing of that statement reflected a, a shared interest in being as forthcoming as possible while at the same time not jeopardizing our ability to continue to have insight mm. into what the Russians might be doing. What a day that was. You know that statement comes out at 3.30 in the afternoon. Within a half hour, the Access Hollywood uh, crude remarks from the president appear, and a half hour after that, there's a WikiLeaks uh, a dump of, uh, of the John Podesta emails. Uh, what, we, what was happening that day for you when, when it went out and then you watched all of that follow on? The, the run-up to the election it seemed like every day there was breaking news. And um, yes, I was mindful of the other things that were happening uh, on that day. But uh, as intelligence professionals, as the head of the CIA, needed to make sure that you keep a trained eye on what it is that you need to do. Uh, Russian interference in the election was not the only issue I was dealing with. I was dealing with a lot of other things, and the terrorism front, and the Middle East front, uh, North Korea. So it's just, uh, in some respects, a typical day where there are a lot of things on the intelligence national security front that are burning. But at the same time, there are a lot of other things uh, that are maybe on the sidelines that distract the attention and focus of, of some people from some of those national security matters. But uh, I must say that I really felt that the, the National Security Council, the Obama administration, uh, at the highest levels uh, remained uh, fixated on this issue of, of Russia interference in the election, irrespective of the other news that might be coming out. The other event that happens in September, of course, is the president goes to G20, the G20, and pulls uh, President Putin aside. Obviously, y you were part of the briefing of, of the president, the, all the dimensions of all the things he'd have to talk to Putin about if the occasion presented itself. What happened there? Well, I think uh, the picture tells a thousand words. <laughs> when you look at the image of Mr. Putin and President Obama on the sidelines of the summit, I think President Obama's face really conveys a sense of deep concern uh, and uh, sending a message to Mr. Putin. And so we had talked about the importance of making sure that 
uh, President Obama seized that opportunity so that Mr. Putin had no misunderstanding whatsoever. Uh, we were confident that Mr. Bortnikov relayed the information that I did uh, to Mr. Putin. But uh, similarly, uh, just the way I didn't want to pass up an opportunity of engagement with Bortnikov, I think the President wanted to make sure that uh, Mr. Putin understood the, the gravity of this, uh, the seriousness with which Mr. Uh, President Obama viewed it, and uh, the need to cease and desist. On October 7th, when the statement is finally released, there's been a lot of talk and back and forth about the American people need to know. They need to know something. They need to know some details. They need to know that you guys are all in agreement about it and that it's... Uh, and at that moment, there it is, the, finally the release, the justification, and it gets subsumed and, and carried into the vortex of the Donald Trump... Uh, let's not even characterize it, crude behavior... Uh, mm -hmm. Tape. Big, big loss from your point of view that the that it was sort of taken over by that event. You know, you can never uh, predict the uh, what's going to happen when you release something like that. Uh, the news of the day uh, continues to unfold. Um, we want to make sure we got it out um, as as quickly as we could uh, after the deliberation took place. Uh, and whether or not uh, people took it uh, seriously. By then, uh, all the, the press, the media, uh, were covering the interference in the election. Uh, there was a debate back and forth uh, about whether or not it was needed or necessary to go out with a statement like that, or should it be harder hitting or less or whatever. There was a lot of back and forth about, about the statement and about how strong the statement should be. Once we decided on the language of the statement, we wanted to make sure we were able to get it out uh, quickly and so it was released. Uh, we knew that it was going to get pick up in the media, obviously. Uh, people were anticipating, I think, that the administration was going to be saying something publicly. But then when it was, it seemed to be overtaken in some respects by the, uh, the video and the audio of Mr. Trump's um, comments, um, it, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say it was disappointing, but uh, it is a fact of life. Uh, that's what happens in, certainly in Washington. Uh, you can never predict what other newsworthy stories are going to be coming out at a time when you release a statement. Uh, but uh, I, I think by then, uh, we were all convinced that the American people were aware of this Russian uh, interference. Uh, but we thought it was very, very important to get on the record uh, that uh, this was the certainly the considered judgment, in fact, unanimous judgment uh, about uh, those activities. It also felt to me, feels to me as I look back on it, like uh, the White House had pretty much decided by October 7th, look, we'll deal with this after the election. We'll, whatever, whatever we do, however forcefully we respond, that response will follow Hillary Clinton's election because almost everybody believed that Hillary Clinton was going to win. Well, in the run-up to the election, I think the president always felt as though if he needed to take more aggressive action against Russia, he could. Uh, and he saw that there was going to be opportunities uh, before to do something if necessary, but as well afterward. And um, it was, I think, uh, determined that we didn't want to get into an escalatory uh, cyber uh, battle with the Russians because uh, there were options that were considered as far as the things that we could do in the cyber realm. But there is a question about then what would the Russians have done to counter that? And if they were going to counter it, uh, how that could have further interfered in the election or undermined the credibility. Is that in the realm of what we were worried about, about the states and about uh, getting actually inside the the process, the, uh, the, the technical, the, the vote-gathering uh, process? Yeah, by, by October, middle of October, we were aware of what Russia was trying to do vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the state systems. And uh, we knew that there were capabilities that the Russians could have exercised that would have raised even greater questions about the credibility and integrity of the election. And so what we didn't want to do was to take some type of action that would have uh, negligible or marginal impact on the Russians, but yet trigger some type of Russian counteraction. 
which would have, I think, uh, been quite disruptive uh, of the electoral system and I think raised questions uh, about uh, the validity of the outcome. And at this time, as everybody was watching the polls, I think everybody was pretty convinced that uh, Hillary Clinton was going to win uh, the election. I think the Russians were convinced of that. I think most political observers, as well as officials in Washington. And uh, when looking back on it now, and I think if, if people in Washington and, and the White House felt that there was a closer race, would they have done things differently? I don't know. That's something that I think uh, President Obama would have to, to answer. Uh, I do think that the president tried to do it in a manner that was going to be as unbiased um, and least disruptive as possible. And when I saw the options that were available, uh, even if he thought that uh, Mr. Trump was going to emerge the winner, I don't think the president would have opted for any of the uh, scenarios that would have involved a, a U.S. cyber response against Russia prior to the election. I just don't think well, he would have done it. Were all of you who held things fairly closely and were getting lots of different kinds of intelligence, were you also aware of the appearance of collusion by the, by the Trump family, by Kushner, by young Don Jr., the, the Russian banker, the Russian lawyer, the, the uh, uh, other things that seem to be going on, uh, Roger Stone talking to Guccifer and, 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 and saying, you know, watch out, Podesta's next. All of that, were you in on all of that as well? There were uh, things that happened, meetings that took place uh, between individuals uh, on the Russian side and on the U.S. side uh, that raised my concerns about um, collaboration uh, related to the election. And I didn't know what was uh, motivating some people, but I certainly was concerned. And anything that we had that involved U.S. persons, anything that the CIA collected or had information about involving U.S. persons, we immediately shared it with the FBI because it's their responsibility to pull those investigative threads. So um, I was aware contemporaneously of some things that were going on, uh, which again, you know, caused me to furrow my brow and say, what's this all about? But uh, I didn't uh, follow it up. Um, I was confident that the FBI would be able to do its job. Were there things that we don't, did you know things that, and do you know things that we didn't know? <laughs> CIA director always knows things that others don't know. So there were more of these events than we know now? Uh, anything that we uncovered that was relevant to the election and Russian interference, and anything especially that involved U.S. persons or individuals associated with the Trump campaign, that information was made available to the FBI. And uh, it was FBI's job then to follow up on it. And, a lot of those investigative leads, if you will, um, I don't know uh, what happened as a result because that's the FBI's responsibility, not CIA's responsibility. Okay, so when we get to the day of the election, what are you worrying about uh, as the head of the Central Intelligence Agency and the guy who's read in on basically everything that's happening? What are you watching for? What are you worried about? I'm not talking about in winners and losers, but the process. Well, in the, in the days before the election, uh, there was uh, constant interaction between the experts at CIA, FBI, and NSA, making sure that we shared with each other the latest insight into what might be happening and what the Russians might be doing. And uh, we were monitoring and using our collection capabilities to uh, understand what the Russians might have up their sleeve at the 11th hour. And uh, I was kept informed by my people, um, and we were very uh, focused on making sure that any indicator of some type of disruptive activity on Election Day was going to be um, uncovered and therefore and, and consequently shared. But uh, 
So again, in the life of a CI director, you have uh, a dozen things that you're focusing on because the world doesn't allow you just to focus on one. Uh, and so I was confident that my people would tell me if we saw anything um, that the Russians might be doing on election day. Was there any one single thing, the, the hacking of the states, something like that, that really concerned you as we got up to, to the zero hour? Well, I was, <laughs> there were concerns about could the Russians do something with the voter registration rolls? Uh, make names disappear, manipulate some things and prevent some people from voting. Didn't have to be the vote tallies itself. Um, I was, as I was watching some of the returns come in, uh, I know that some of those returns are, are sent from the precincts to the, you know, the state centers and they are sent over the internet. Uh, or is, is there going to be some type of action that the Russians might take to uh, prevent those uh, tallies from being delivered? Uh, so I, I, I didn't know um, if the Russians were going to do anything at all. And I thought if they did that, it clearly would be a sign that uh, Putin had authorized a exceptionally, an unprecedented aggressive assault against this country that to me would have been tantamount to, to war, um, actually doing something against the, uh, the, the voters or the votes on election day. So um, I was, uh, I was uh, wondering whether or not we'd see that. We've talked to lots of people in Russia about what it was like in Moscow that day, Moscow that day, what Putin's response was. Uh, what was your response, uh, Mr. Brennan, to the election results and, uh, and, 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 yeah, so what was your response to the election results? Well, speaking as a, as a individual U.S. citizen, U.S. voter, I was, I was surprised at the election results. But then, you know, that's, it's a momentary bit of surprise. And then we kick in, as we always do, to make sure that we fulfill our responsibilities. And I was then President-elect Obama's uh, lead for uh, the intelligence transition from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. And I was so, so impressed by just what a great job the Bush administration did in terms of welcoming us and making sure we were as well prepared as possible when the Obama administration took over the reins of government in January of 2009. And so President Obama had previously told us that he wanted um, our transition effort to be as good, if not better, uh, as the Bush uh, team. So we had already uh, worked up some things to provide to the new incoming team. And so the day after the election, uh, met with the folks and said, okay, let's be ready to give the individuals who are going to be anointed as the part of the new administration uh, the briefings that they needed, uh, set up the meetings, and we had some of our best people pull together uh, materials, books, briefings uh, for that. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited. <laughs> and uh, no one really came knocking on our door, uh, which concerned me, because I knew that this was going to be an enormous, enormous climb for the, the Trump team, because I really felt that they were probably more surprised than anybody that they were elected. Uh, they were ill-prepared uh, for it. Uh, they were not ready. Uh, and so there was very, very sparse and limited interaction uh, between the incoming team and the outgoing team, particularly on the intelligence front. And so all the materials, all the briefings, all the, the readiness that we had trying to emulate what the Bush administration did to such a great extent, um, it really was um, not uh, utilized uh, by the new team, which was disappointing because I knew I understand just how complex uh, the role is for the incoming team and how complex and complicated and dangerous the world is. And so I was very concerned that uh, they were going to take over on the 20th of January without the preparation that was needed. And I think that's exactly what happened. Did you, in the immediate aftermath of Trump's victory, worry that something untoward had happened to give him the victory? 
I was very concerned that Mr. Trump was, uh, again, ill-prepared for the job, that he didn't have a good grasp of uh, international affairs, the domestic policy scene, the legislative process, uh, U.S. law, intelligence capabilities. I had already engaged in some back and forth publicly with Mr. Trump because of his disparaging remarks about the intelligence community. I was very much hoping and believing that Mr. Trump was going to um, learn on the job and grow into the position. But then a couple days after he was inaugurated, he showed up at CIA headquarters and in front of our hollowed memorial wall, um, started to talk politics, which I thought was um, very inappropriate and uh, disgraceful in many ways. So, uh, yeah, uh, I was very concerned that uh, we were going to be in for a, a, a different type of administration, a different type of presidency. And um, maybe I was spoiled by the eight years of President Obama, who I thought had the utmost integrity, um, utmost decency as far as how he treated other people, and also a tremendous intellect and understanding of, of the world and our Constitution and our laws. But I will say that uh, you know, I've talked with many people in the Obama administration. You know, we want the administration, the Trump administration, to succeed. We want this president to be successful. We want this country to be strong. Um, but I must say that our institutions of governance are being tested. And uh, Mr. Trump still doesn't in my view, understand the, the solemn, the sacred obligations of being President of the United States. It's not all about him. Um, it's about this country. And um, he needs to, uh, I think, adjust his, his mindset um, if, if he's going to do what he needs to do for the American people. Let me, let me go back one more, one more thought about the election day, the post-election day. Did you believe, as a as a as a law enforcement, as a as a, a national security expert, that there was? Do you believe there was any possibility that the Trump team colluded with the Russians uh, on the election results? I don't know whether or not there was any collaboration, collusion, or conspiracy that took place between. U.S. persons and, and Russians related to the election. And I think it would be unfair for me to speculate about individuals doing that. But I will say there were things that were taking place that I believe required the FBI to investigate to um, ensure that there was no such collusion, collaboration, or conspiracy uh, between U.S. persons, including those associated with the campaign, and, and Russia. The American people deserve to know. Do you think they're investigating those things? I have great confidence uh, in the FBI's ability to carry out uh, these investigations. And they, they are particularly adept and adroit at uh, pulling threads, uh, especially on the financial front. Uh, I've been involved in, in many counterterrorism investigations and counterintelligence investigations over the years. And pulling on those financial threads frequently reveals very interesting relationships and um, acts of, of uh, a criminal nature. And so that's what the FBI's job is, and that's what they're, they're very uh, adroit at doing. Uh, so I have great confidence in their, their abilities. So during that period, from the end of the thing till from the election day to sort of Thanksgiving, the way people in the White House tell us they were sort of reeling, um, but there, there there was a sort of sense from the president. Let's get all the ducks in a row about what to do about the hacking, about what to do about Russia, about what the signals are. There was, uh, we've heard John Kerry's position, we've heard others position, let's get really strong, let's go after these guys, let's punish them, let's re release his bank accounts, let's do whatever the, the thoughts were at the time. It eventually comes down to, 
on the 29th of December, the sanctions, the expelling of 35 people and the seizing and whatever of the two houses as announced by the president and from Hawaii. Uh, were they strong enough? Were those sanctions strong enough, given the magnitude of the incursion and the crime? <clears throat> you know, those 10 weeks between Election Day and Inauguration Day <laughs> go very quickly, and there's just a lot to do. And uh, the president and others wanted to make sure that we were able to take some actions against the Russians. Uh, this was long in coming because uh, we wanted to take actions against the Russians for a lot of their harassment of, of U.S. officials. So this was sort of a, uh, a culmination of, of concerns along those lines. Um, we knew that we were going to uh, be out of office on the 20th of January. And we knew that uh, the next administration, the Trump administration, could uh, undo some of the things that we did. Um, the, uh, the White House, I think, was keeping the Trump team informed about uh, the steps that we were considering, uh, ongoing engagements with their, their team. Uh, were they strong enough? I don't, I don't know. Um, it, it, for things that would have been much more strategic in impact and broader in scope, I think would have taken longer to implement and would have required the incoming team to continue that effort. And we were very uncertain whether or not the incoming team would do that. So uh, there was focus on what it is that we could do in the short term that was going to send a clear signal, going to hurt. Uh, and I can remember vividly the discussions that we had in the Situation Room about how many Russian intelligence officers uh, should be PNG'd and whether it should be just a small number or a larger number or whatever. Uh, and there was a, a pretty strong um, uh, consensus that we wanted to do as much as we could uh, because it was the right thing to do. And we didn't know what the Trump administration was going to do. Again, we were still puzzled by a lot of the comments that Mr. Trump and others were making about Russia. They didn't seem to be taking this concern seriously. Um, they didn't seem to want to understand a lot of the, the details of what it is that we, we knew, uh, and they were a bit dismissive <laughs> of the conclusions. So uh, we knew that we had to uh, take action, and so we, we said, well, this is the, what is appropriate now. And one of the things that I think we took some comfort in was we had a lot of uh, engagement with the Congress during this period of time. I had number of calls from senior members of Congress who wanted to ensure that we did everything possible, first of all, to preserve the information and the intelligence that we had about the interference, uh, because they wanted to take up this mantle in the, the new year. And I said to a number of them that the, the institutions of governance are really going to require the Congress and the congressional committees to do what is right here. I said, I don't know what the Trump administration is going to do when they come in. I said, I have my concerns about some of the attitudes toward Russia and Mr. Putin, but uh, I have confidence, even with all my, my battles with Congress over the years, this is what Congress, as a co-equal branch of government, really has an obligation to do. Do what is right for the American people, irrespective of political party affiliation, irrespective of the, the views of a of an individual who happens to be inhabiting the Oval Office. And uh, so in my conversations with members of Congress from both sides of the aisle, I had uh, growing confidence that this was not going to end with the end of the Obama administration, that this was going to continue. And I knew that Jim Comey was not going to be uh, out of office on January 20th. And I have tremendous respect for Jim Comey. And I knew that the FBI was going to do its, uh, its work uh, so that this would not be uh, covered up. And uh, I think we see now, many mo months afterward, this continues to, uh, to percolate. And uh, the American people deserve answers. And uh, Congress, the FBI, Department of Justice will get us those answers, whether or not Mr. Trump wants to hear those answers or deal with them or not. The uh, president makes the announcement from Hawaii on the 29th. 
Were you sort of holding your breath about which one of the people who worked for you or how many people you worked for were about to be expelled from Russia or worse? I, I, I voted, uh, well, I was very supportive of throwing out as many Russians, uh, even more if we could, uh, as possible because um, I came to know what the Russians are up to and uh, I wanted as many Russian intelligence officers out of this country as possible. Um, and there were people in CIA who were uh, concerned about that and advocated for fewer because they were concerned that there was going to be retaliatory steps taken uh, against our diplomats in, in Moscow. And I was of the view that the, the Russians were not going to retaliate in kind. Uh, and I th it was based on my assessment that they were looking forward to uh, the Trump administration uh, taking over in Washington and that they didn't want to uh, take these actions that would be disruptive in their minds because they, I think, had great hopes for uh, a rapprochement of sorts between Moscow and Washington come January 20th. Little did you know that from the Dominican Republic beach, uh, Mike Flynn is uh, making a call to Ambassador Kislyak, assuring him of that actual fact that uh, he didn't have to worry about the sanctions and that uh, Mr. Putin should hold his fire. Yeah, I, I, and I was not encouraged by what I uh, was seeing and hearing from you know the Trump team uh, about their views toward Russia, and I was I was not of a mind that they were going to follow through uh, with additional pressure on Russia once they came into office, and I think that was borne out by the facts. We have to talk about the Trump Tower meeting where you guys go and talk to the president-elect, uh, show him the evidence, uh, talk to him, talk turkey to him about what it really was. Can you take me there, talk about at least what you were trying to convey and how that went? Now we had a meeting with Mr. Trump at Trump Tower, and it was several hours long. Um, we talked to him about what it is that we <coughs> knew and assessed. We talked about um, what the Russian objectives were. Uh, what the capabilities are, and it was uh, it was a back and forth. Um, but I'm not going to get into details of that meeting. Can you tell me how he was? What was he like when you went in? Was he different when it was over? Uh, Mr. Trump was was gracious. He welcomed us. He thanked us for our service. He listened, uh, and I would say that his. His graciousness and his demeanor did not change from the beginning to the end of the conversation. So uh, he was, I think he was at home in the Trump Tower and just, you know, was, uh, he listened because I think he felt as though he, he should. But you don't feel you changed his mind? From his public comments that he made before the meeting at Trump Tower uh, to the comments he made subsequent to that briefing, I don't think he changed his his mind, or at least he didn't change his uh, public attitude and his statements. But what he says publicly, which tends to be rather skeptical of the intelligence, and what he believes in his heart of hearts may be two very different things. Uh, I think sometimes he, he talks because he feels as though he has to say certain things in order to appeal to maybe his base or to others, but uh, I don't know what he truly believes or if he is truly dismissive of the intelligence. Uh, but he is a obviously a rather a deft politician and who uh, continues to do and say and tweet things because he believes that that's a way to convey messages that he wants conveyed to, uh, to the American people. Did you give him the full Monty? Was it all, was it everything, was it the hard stuff? The we provided to him the briefing that, as president-elect, he deserved to get. Yeah, what does that mean? It, it means there were a number of other people in that room, so it wasn't just the president-elect. There mm -hmm. was members of his team. 
Mm. And so therefore, uh, I had to take that into account. I see. And I made sure that he understood the, uh, the strength of our confidence in our assessments. Uh, but uh, again, I, I was was mindful of the environment and uh, the people there. But uh, yeah, he he should have come away with uh, a very clear understanding of just where Jim's Cla- James Clapper, Jim Comey, Mike Rogers, and John Brennan came out on these issues. Mm. Uh, there was uh, no equivocation in our language, and we were very uh, direct uh, and. Uh, very, uh, very clear in terms of what it is that uh, we knew and assessed. Of course, Comey uh, privately gives him the Steele dossier information or talks about it or either shows it to him. You, you, you obviously have seen the Steele dossier. What do you make of it? The intelligence community assessment did not take into account anything that was included in that dossier. Uh, that dossier had been circulating for quite some time. Uh, it was certainly not a secret among Washington journalists and reporters, but it was still unclear to to us, and I think to Jim Comey, about how much the president-elect was, was aware of this. And so, uh, again, I defer to Jim Comey to uh, explain and describe exactly uh, what he did uh, in terms of any discussions he might have had with the president-elect. So we started with, uh, with uh, uh, Vladimir Putin in, in Ukraine. We went backwards to Vladimir Putin as a KGB officer in Dresden. We watched him grow up and become a man who, in, who out of a sense of grievance and probably revenge, uh, exercises the full power of his office, apparently, to muck around in the American election. Why did he do it? In your mind, why did he do that? I think he interfered in the election because he could and because he was determined to hurt Hillary Clinton, who he believed was going to become president. I believe he wanted her to be inaugurated and at a time when she was going to be um, bloodied a bit by these uh, exposures. And I do think that he probably had other things planned as far as uh, if she were elected, uh, both before the inauguration and afterward. Uh, One of his principal objectives has been to drive a wedge between the United States and Europe as a way to uh, get sanctions relief because those sanctions are hurting the Russian economy and uh, it's one of Mr. Putin's highest priorities. And uh, I do believe that he was going to try to use Russian intelligence services to further sow suspicion between European capitals and Washington under a Hillary Clinton presidency. And uh, I am pretty confident that the Russians probably had a few things up their sleeves uh, that would be used to try to discredit that Clinton presidency. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Again, he sees things in zero-sum fashion. If, if the U.S. president or the U.S. is diminished in the eyes of the world in any way or is hurt, it just benefits Russia. And that's why when I think about how Mr. Putin feels now about developments in the United States, when he sees that Mr. Trump has been hobbled in many respects by this investigation and it has hurt Mr. Trump's ability to legislate to focus on a lot of national security and domestic policy matters, and that uh, there is growing tension uh, in Washington over this issue. To me, I think Mr. Putin sees this as a tremendous success, because if the United States is not able to exercise the full weight of its capabilities um, internationally, um, Russia benefits. And also, given Mr. Trump's view about uh, the U.S. role in the world, uh, and uh, from his inaugural address to other comments about the U.S. is, you know, first, 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 I think it has raised questions in the minds of a number of our allies and partners 
um, as well as in the minds of our adversaries about you know, U.S. taking a step back from that world stage, which is, I think, unnerving to a lot of our partners around the world, which, again, uh, Mr. Putin sees as beneficial to Moscow. So, uh, and I don't know whether or not Russian uh, interference in our election had uh, influence on a single vote. I have no idea. That was not our responsibility to do, and I don't know. But when I look at the aftermath, uh, I think Mr. Putin is is fairly, is very content in terms of the deleterious impact it's had on the U.S. politically, internationally. Now, the U.S.-Russian relationship has not gotten on a, a better track um, after the uh, election. So from that perspective, I think Mr. Putin has been uh, frustrated. But I think overall he sees it as a as a net plus hmm. uh, in terms of what he did in the election and how it has consumed U.S. politics and uh, you know the, the U.S. public in many respects. And you know, given that this is a story that's still playing out, uh, I think Mr. Putin is uh, is very uh, comfortable with his decision to authorize this interference. Following up on the Flynn. Uh story, you, you tell the beginning of the film story. The lessons learned from how that came down, the fact that he was eventually fired, but not until it came out in the Washington Post, the way the White House, the, the Obama White House sort of viewed that story, anything that you came away from on the Flynn story that helped sum it up and sort of the lessons learned? Uh, uh, I think one of the real lessons learned is that for any incoming administration, the initial team you put together, even before you take office, you really need to make sure that these are individuals of tremendous integrity and individuals that uh, the president-elect is comfortable with sharing the most sensitive national security information. And even though some people may have served previously in government or even in the military, there needs to be a very, very thorough vetting process. Uh, the Obama team had a very thorough vetting process. Um, everybody had to uh, meet the standards uh, so that you would have access to uh, top secret information, uh, but also that you didn't have any conflicts of interest or uh, ethical issues uh, that uh, would be disqualifying. And that's why I think that the Trump team uh, was a bit of a pickup game, <laughs> quite frankly. it's. Mm. And again, understandably because they were surprised. They don't think they were going to win. And then when all of a sudden they were faced with the daunting task of putting together a team, things happened very quickly and rapidly, and I think there was a looseness there that, uh, that hurt us. And, and uh, so uh, there were people who, who came in and went very quickly uh, that there should have been greater scrutiny and greater uh, effort to ensure that uh, the people that were going to be brought into the tent early on were going to be able to stay there and that they, they met the requirements of, of such high office. When you think back about the aggressive efforts that were made in 2016 that you saw, is the adversary here the opposing intelligence services, in other words, the SBR and GRU, or was there any evidence and did you have a theory that also essentially there are non-state actors, maybe under the direction of the state, You've been very clear that you felt Mr. Putin would have approved this, but uh, how clear do you feel is the chain of the actual actors who carry it out? Does it go to the other services, or is it a little more ambiguous? Well, I think right now in the cyber realm, a lot of intelligence services are building up indigenous capabilities, um, and they're quite formidable, especially when you talk about the Russians and the Chinese. But increasingly, these intelligence services contract out a lot of the work for a variety of reasons. One is that there's just tremendous uh, capabilities of these pop-up companies and firms and groups that can deploy malware and ransomware or whatever else. And so there's tremendous expertise and capability in the private sector, including in the Russian private sector that the Russian intelligence services take advantage of. But secondly, um, intelligence services, nation states want to try to cover their tracks. And uh, from a forensic standpoint, they want to have some distance between the actual forensics of some type of attack and uh, the nation state. And therefore, contracting out some of these activities uh, allows them to, uh, 
take advantage of the expertise that resides out there, but also to uh, uh, make it more difficult for attribution to be made and mm -hmm. to uh, um, see a, a nation state behind these uh, actions. Ta da! Well, I'm not sure. When I heard that Jim Comey was summarily dismissed, first of all, I thought it was done in an exceptionally disrespe disrespectful way. Jim Comey has given much of his life to keep this country safe and strong, did an outstanding job as the director of the FBI, and to be treated um, that way, um, I think really uh, sent shockwaves to a number of people, especially at the FBI. And I think it showed the disdain that Mr. Trump has for professionals and the, uh, the FBI. So uh, I was also very disturbed because it was clear that uh, Mr. Trump was um, dismayed and upset over Mr. Comey's relentless pursuit of the truth. And I wonder why Mr. Trump is concerned about the uncovering of the truth if there's nothing to hide there. Uh, and the FBI does a great job. It's diligent, it's uh, patient, but uh, it finds the truth. And so I, I was concerned about what does this really reflect on the part of Mr. Trump? Uh, why is he uh, trying to prevent the truth from coming out? Why is he trying to prevent the FBI from doing its, its uh, duty? But I am comfortable, confident that uh, so the FBI will continue to do its work uh, with even greater uh, focus momentum as a result of this firing.